Hey, if you like The Thoughtful Gamer and want to support it, click on the Patreon link below. Hey everybody, it's Mark here with The Thoughtful Gamer, and it is Netrunner time. I love Netrunner. And the new set just got released, Midnight Sun. We've got rotation happening, so I'm going to go over what's going on with Netrunner. Uh, if you are not familiar or slightly familiar with Netrunner, I will try to keep things fairly simple. I'm not going to get into too much uh, detail. If you know nothing about Netrunner, I would recommend looking up uh, the stuff I've written about Netrunner before, uh, which I will post the link to in the description. But I'm not going to get too technical because I'm not that good at Netrunner and I would probably mess things up. I know enough about the meta to talk somewhat and speculate somewhat about what's going on. However, uh, I'm no expert by any means. I'm just super excited and enthusiastic. Uh, so let's look at what's going to happen. I'm going to first go over what's getting rotated out of standard, uh, what cards we're losing, the significant cards at least, and then I'll go into the new stuff we're getting with Midnight Sun which has been all spoiled now, and I believe it, as of today, the day I'm recording this is released. Uh, so I will be getting my pack within the next couple of weeks, and then once I'm done with all of my summer vacation slash work trips, I will start playing Netrunner in person again. Uh, but let's start with the rotated cards. I just pronounced ro rotated weirdly there. Haha, -ha, here we go. Uh, so, fun fact, if you go to Netrunner DB and you click on more, you can click on rotation and you get to this page, which shows all the cards that are being rotated, uh, which is exciting. Hopefully it's accurate. I know Netrunner DB occasionally isn't 100% accurate. I know they're also working on a new version of the site that's going to be uh, substantially better, I assume. Even then, it's a fantastic site and I use it all the time. Uh, let's talk about... Let's start with Runner first, because that's where uh, the Midnight Sun spoilers listed Runner first, and that's kind of traditional. So let's talk about the cards that we're losing that are significant. First, we've got Rebirth of the neutral cards. Super significant. The best Runner deck right now uses Rebirth. Uh, it's a max deck. Uh, it uses Rebirth to switch out of max once you run out of your, once you've drawn through your entire deck max draws cards and also trashes cards uh, into usually Omar who is able to access R&D or uh, HQ by running archives once per turn uh, it's a very annoying deck to play against because right when you just when you got your R&D and HQ uh, built up and protected, they rebirth into Omar, and then now you got to try to protect archives, and by that time you've usually lost. At least that's my experience with it. Uh, so being able to switch your identity to a different identity, no longer. Uh, we still have uh, DJ Fenris, who does something slightly different but fairly similar but that is in criminal it's not in any neutral id or neutral card uh, so rebirth was really cool kind of glad it's going away uh, honestly a lot of that max deck including max herself uh, is gone which is exciting because it was basically the best deck in netrunner it, it, it was definitely the best runner deck uh, sports hopper is going away uh, this is a significant card because for a while there, and on and off, uh, it was a, pr a pretty well used, commonly used uh, damage prevention card. It doesn't prevent damage, but it prevents you from dying to things like boom, because if you're at five cards or even four cards, you can trash Sports Hopper the moment you get tagged, draw three cards, and now they're boom, which does seven damage isn't going to kill you. It'll still sting, but it won't necessarily kill you. Right now, I don't think it's used very often from what I've seen, but in the past, it has been a pretty, a uh, fairly common card. I used it a, a good amount. 
Another one we're losing that's somewhat significant is data folding. Uh, this is significant to me because my favorite runner is Sunny, and this is a card that Sunny loves because Sunny always has extra MU, and it's a nice credit drip if you have extra MU. I don't know how many people are going to be sad about this, but I am a little bit. And then finally for neutral cards, we've got the Turning Wheel, uh, which is really commonly used because it is a neutral card. It costs one influence, and it is a multi-access card. Uh, so with this gun, I believe all or most multi-access is now going to be in faction, uh, and so we don't have the Turning Wheel anymore. I don't really care one way or another on the Turning Wheel. It was a neat card. They're probably not creating like a replacement for it partially because they're not there are no neutral cards in this first set um but also because the idea of multi-access being an in-faction thing i think is is thematically and just i don't know just mechanically probably a good idea so not too sad about that one on Anarch, Anarch loses a lot, partially because there are a ton of Anarch, Anarch cards that are rotating because the set, one of the sets that is rotating had Anarch cards. I don't know, the, the Fantasy Flight sets would often choose specific factions that would get cards in certain sets. Midnight Sun, and I think all the previous sets have had cards for each faction in each set, so maybe that's something Nisa is doing. Uh, but there are way more Anarch cards, as you can see, that are rotating than Krim or uh, Shaper. Big ones that are going away. Obviously, Max. The best Anarch card for years and years, or Anarch ID for years and years, uh, because it gives you a free card draw each turn. You do have to trash the top two cards of your stack, but they had lots and lots of stuff uh, to help uh, mitigate that downside. Um, and in fact, of course, the Breaker Suite with cards like Paperclip, uh, that wanted to be trashed. So Max going away is huge. However, the new Anarch ID is really cool. So I think Anarch players are going to be fine with it. Uh, other significant cards. We lose the Cutlery, Forked, Knifed, and Spooned, which are ways you can trash ice. Trashing ice is very tricky to design around. Uh, because it can be a huge credit and tempo swing and click swing for the runner. The cutlery at various times has been extremely powerful, and it is in some of it is in the max deck that is being run or was being run that was the best deck. So I'm kind of glad it's gone. We also lose Run Amuck, which is another card that trashes ice. Um, but it gives the corp a choice. This one was not run as much, although I did see it. Uh, we still have on passant, which is in the, uh, the new core set basically, um, or the system update, I believe it's called, uh, which I believe is the, the final bit of ice trashing stuff that Anarch got. So we, they still have that card to trash ice, um, which I think is good. A little bit of ice trashing threat is a good thing to have. What else did they lose? Uh, Eater is fairly significant. This is a very, very efficient AI breaker, so it breaks any type of ice. Um, good numbers on it, good stats, but the downside, you cannot access uh, cards for the remainder of this run. However, it would be combined with cards like uh is it in here no i guess it's not in here oh no here it is wanton destruction um instead of breaching hq you may spend any number of clicks to force the car corp to trash that many cards from hq at random uh there are a couple of other cards that were commonly used with eater where you didn't have to access cards you could do other things usually th trashing cards to then run on archives and uh, access the cards you just trashed there. So I never liked playing those decks, so I'm fine with Eater going away. Uh, AI breakers are very tricky, again, to design around, so um, it's fine with me. As you can tell, I'm not an Anarch player. Occasionally, and honestly, with the new Anarch ID, I might really like it. So we'll see. But 
but typically I'm more in criminal or shaper, or as I said, sunny. Uh, I tend to like slightly slower runners that build up stuff. Um, not not super risk risky type of person. We also lose some virus stuff, some virus, I would say, economy cards, uh, which are hive mind, uh, progenitor, and virus breeding ground. So hive mind, uh, basically the virus token or counters that are on hive mind count for all your other virus cards. Progenitor um, prevents one virus counter on uh, a virus that's hosted on this from being removed when viruses are purged. And virus breeding ground gives you virus counters each turn and then you can move them to other cards so these are like not the cards that you actually do stuff with with viruses but they feed those viruses um, virus decks like virus centric decks haven't been that popular from what i've seen although a few virus cards have been seen some use so i don't think it'll be a big hit but it is significant thematically and then finally very very significant is salsa slums which is an anti uh, asset spam card uh, because once per turn when you play the pay the trash card of an access trash cost of an access card you remove it from the game instead of trashing it we're losing the primary asset spam id which i'll talk about in a bit so i don't think this is a huge loss or rather it doesn't open up massive asset spam opportunities necessarily I don't know I'm curious to see how, how this plays out it was getting a good amount of play Anarch loses I think the most of any faction in the game uh, runner or corp they're losing a lot of cards that are played in almost every Anarch deck and then some cards that are played in many other decks as well uh, criminal Loses a couple, loses basically one really significant card, which is Paul op, Political Operative. Uh, however, there is a pseudo replacement uh, in the uh, in the new set, and I really like the replacement how they change it. Basically, it lets you trash a resed card um, without running the server that card is in, which is a really good. This is a a significant tech card against certain decks where you really have to trash some cards um, or at least threaten to uh, but I like the replacement other ones that are somewhat notable spy camera sometimes saw some play where you get to peek at um, the top of R&D although I'm finding that people are running the card find the truth from Adam instead that does a similar thing if they're doing this kind of peek at at, at the top of R&D thing so I don't know I, it's all play for a little while but I, I haven't seen it recently um, and then tech trader there were sometimes some really fun decks where people use lots of trash abilities and they got money from it it was never an A tier deck from what I remember but you know this kind of fed a certain sub archetype so I thought I would point it out Shaper isn't losing much at all. I mean, Jesminder saw some play. It's kind of a meta call because if you're not running against a corp deck that wants to tag you, it and tag you during a run, it was basically a blank ID, so never a top deck. Uh, Shaper loses out of the ashes, which was seeing some play, especially with the new Shaper card Deep Dive, which we'll get to, uh, because it gives you essentially a free click. Um, with this gone, I think most of the free click stuff shifts over to criminal. So it might be a thematic choice of let's let that be a criminal thing rather than something that can be accessed from multiple, uh, factions. I don't know. That one saw some play. Another one that sometimes saw play was, if I can pronounce this correctly, Pancha Tantra, um, which would let you change the subtype. Oh, wait, no, this isn't the card. Never mind. There's another card that is this but actually good that saw play. Honestly, most of these cards 
net chip sometimes you'd see something uh with net chip if they're building some big huge rig shaper doesn't lose much which is good because shaper is the weakest id at the moment uh so i'm glad they're not losing a lot let's go up to corp neutral cards that are significant uh we lose where'd it go mumba temple this helped asset spam decks because it got you two free credits to uh, res stuff like assets or ice. Um, solid economy card, annoying to me often, uh, but I played it sometimes because I like NVN decks. That's worth mentioning. Uh, Museum of History was already banned, I believe, uh, but was part of... There were a bunch of asset spam decks back in the day that used a lot of these Mumbad Cycle cards that we are now losing. Cyberdex Virus Suite, antivirus card uh, that was very frequently just one was tossed into a corp deck just in case you hit viruses because it purged viruses uh, essentially for free whenever the runner uh, whenever the runner found it. And it would purge it for three credits uh, if you wanted to do it manually. Uh, however, a replacement that is almost identical is being printed in Jinteki, which is interesting to me. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. And then Mumbad Virtual Tour, a card I liked, probably a B-tier card. Uh, it is, does absolutely nothing except that the runner must trash it when they access it if they can. So if they have more than five credits, they're losing five credits. Great in NBN decks, uh, or rather probably B tier in the NBN decks. Sometimes it's one of those cards some people include, some people don't. Not like a staple of NBN decks, but a card that is frequently used and I liked. Moving on to HB. HB loses a bunch of their key cards here advanced assembly lines this helped hb fast decks accelerate with installing assets and gaining money in the process um really key card for all those hb decks maybe most significantly we lose jeeves this is a super super important card it lets HB never advance a 4-2 asset, or anyone who plays this never advance, because you can spend the first three clicks on your turn to advance, you get an additional click, and then you advance it that fourth time. Not having Jeeves, Jeeves as an option is going to really take a bit of time to get used to for me, uh, because you expected it in almost every HB deck. Uh, Lakshmi Smart Fabrics. There are a few decks. HB got a little quick. In other words, faster Never Advance or Fast Advance HB decks were the best ones in the game. Lakshmi, however, was fairly significant when HB Glacier, so a slower style, uh, was popular because it blocked, potentially, runners from stealing certain agendas um, and, you know, force them to waste money and, and, and clicks to run again. Or rather, to wait until next turn, by which time you have scored your agenda. So, I haven't seen it recently, but in the past, this has been a pretty important card. And then, this isn't a significant card for, like, competitive play. However, the dream of brainstorming <laughs> the runner is gone if you get them to run into this without a sentry breaker, they could potentially take up to five or more brain damage, or what is now called core damage. Uh, was always way too expensive, but some janky decks really worked around brainstorm, and the jank is gone. No more brainstorm jank. Sorry. Very sad. Jinteki. Not losing too much. Polana has been a kind of standard Jinteki. It's it's kind of the ID you pick when you don't have, when you just want good value because you could get a credit maybe most turns. So it just gives you some money. So not super spicy, but a solid ID that was used pretty frequently. And then Bioethics Association, which worked on certain types of decks that aren't super popular. 
I don't know why I'm not seeing bioethics a lot in these like grindy Jintaki decks. Maybe there's just other cards that are better. But at one point in time, this was a really annoying card, and it used to be in a bunch of Jintaki decks. Uh, it just does like one net damage a turn, but it's you can't protect it, and it only costs two to trash. So I don't know. Everything else are cards I have not seen in a long time used. Yeah, improved. No one uses that card. No one uses Neural Net. Yeah, Jinteki didn't lose too much. NBN also doesn't lose that much. Aryabata Tech, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, uh, was a really annoying card on NBN decks, used semi frequently uh, to just swing. The credit total might be seen as kind of a win more card, but it was really annoying, and, and I'm glad it's gone, even though I play a lot of NBN. Uh, but by far, the most significant loss on NBN is exchange of information. Uh, this is like a win condition for NBN that they're losing. If a runner is tagged, you can swap an agenda in your area with an agenda in the agenda in the runner score area, yeah, this card wins games. It's really, 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 really good. And, yeah, like with Jeeves, or even more than with Jeeves, it's going to take a little bit of time to get used to not anticipating this card existing and thinking about what other kind of tag punishment there might be out there other than killing. Because the thing is with tags, right, which is usually an NBN or it's, it's an NBN or a Wayland thing, usually because NBN likes to tag people, Wayland likes to kill people when they are tagged. And so the question for any tag-centric card that doesn't do damage is, why play this when instead you could have a card that kills them and you just win the game? So that's why exchange of information is so important because... It answers that by saying, well, this could win the game also. Um, and it only requires one tag, whereas the big kill cards required two or a lot of tags. Uh, so, yeah, big deal with exchange of information. And then Wayland, just like Anarch, had a bunch of cards in this and loses some significant ones. First of all, all the ideas saw play. Argus was never, well, at one point in time was A tier, but not recently, but I'd say solidly B tier from what I could tell. Like, it did fine. Um, it changes the dynamics because every time you steal an agenda, uh, it punishes you. Kind of sad. It's been there, I think, from the beginning. Was this? I don't know. It was originally in Order and Chaos. Man, it's it was, it's been in the card pool I think since I've been playing Netrunner so I, I consider it like a, a foundational card um, kind of sad to see that going not sad to see Gagarin Gagarin I don't know how to pronounce it uh, gone this is the asset spam ID so long hope to never see you again Titan which was banned I'm going to point it out even though it's banned uh, the only Corp deck I've ever had any success with was Titan. It was very fast, basically rushing out to win the game super quickly. Or if the runner got aggressive, you could you know threaten a kill. Uh, I did very well with the Titan deck. Goodbye, Titan, even though I haven't been able to play you. What else we got? Uh, commercial bankers group, which goes along with the asset spam thing because it just it sets up an asset you just have to trash because the credit swing is insane. Uh, if there's no ice protecting the server, the corp gets three credits a turn. Uh, it is cheap, but sometimes you don't have enough money to run trash this and then avoid getting tagged slash killed. So I uh, presented that kind of threat. Um, we also have consulting visit. This is huge. Just like exchange of information, consulting visit is the most significant tutoring card in Netrunner is now gone. Uh, cost two clicks, but you get to find an operation and play it. So normally this means setting up a kill. 
either you find hard hitting news, which gives four tags, or if they're tagged, you find your kill card, boom, or the new one, which I just forgot the name of. Uh, yeah, this is another one where I'm going to have to mentally remember, okay, this card's gone. And then finally, Dedication Ceremony is played a lot. Uh, it puts advancement tokens on a face-up card, but you cannot score that card. But what would happen is there was a fast advance combo where you'd put uh, Dedication Ceremony cards on a different card. I can't remember the name of at the moment. And then you can trash that card and then place those uh, advancement tokens on a card you're scoring so you bypass the cannot score that card because uh, you're not scoring that card you're trashing that card and you put it on the card you're going to score uh, so uh, Wayland loses this fast advance uh, asset or operation that is an asset to their strategy uh, which is fine there are other ways to fast advance I'm kind of glad Wayland loses a bit of fast advance potential um, especially since they got some spicy cards in the new set. That's the significant stuff that I could tell that is rotating, stuff that I was seeing when I was playing every day uh, on Jinteki. Uh, those are the cards I'm seeing. Some other cards that are kind of marginal, I maybe didn't mention, like Vanilla. But there's everyone's got a cheap and the run barrier somewhere. This is just the cheapest one, but it wasn't seeing that much play. Uh, people were using other cheap barriers instead that maybe were slightly spicier. All right, let's switch over to the new stuff. So we've got, let's start with Anarch. New Anarch ID, Essa Afontov, which says, the first time each turn you suffer core damage, you may draw a card and sabotage two. This is the new ability or mechanic for Anarch sabotage and it says what that means right there the corp trashes two cards of their choice from HQ and or the top of R&D very very interesting it's really annoying to have your cards from HQ trashed uh, you do get to choose so if you really, really like what's in your hand you can choose the top of R&D I suspect most of the time you want to trash stuff from HQ because you know what it is, uh, but if you're in a tight spot, it puts you in a tighter spot. Um, the core damage thing is really important because there's so many cards that combo with this, and that's something I'll say about Midnight Sun, is that this might be the most thematically slash mechanically tight set. Like Each faction is getting essentially an archetype. They're getting a bunch of cards that all work together, usually with an ID, uh, to do a specific strategy. So I'm very curious to see. I don't know if we've ever seen archetypes being created so specifically in a single set before in Netrunner. So I'm very curious to see how it plays out. I suspect among the runners... As sad as it is to say, because Anarch's been strong forever, Anarch might be the best one. It seems really good. Uh, for example, you can take a core damage and gain three clicks. So now you've got uh, two more clicks to play with, because you pay one to do running hot, and then you get core damage. But that gives you a card draw and a sabotage two right away. So then you can do stuff. Like Cha to Chastushka, um, where you can sabotage four if you make a successful run on HQ, which is significant because usually Anarch cards don't reward HQ runs. It's very rare. That's a criminal thing. I wonder if that's why there's so much blue background on this card because it's kind of a criminal card. <laughs> um, so if you do core damage and you do this, you could have a sabotage six turn where they have to trash the top six cards of R&D or, and or H cards from HQ. Uh, that seems pretty significant. Kind of expensive. We'll see if it has play. It seems good. Uh, but then you get, first of all, you get the I've had worse replacement because I think I've had worse. Did it rotate? 
Did I miss that? Yeah, it rotated. I forgot to write it down in my notes. So I've had worse draw three cards if you play it, but if it's trashed uh, with net or meat damage, that's interesting. N not core damage. Not usually applicable. Uh, you draw three cards. Uh, this card is somewhat similar. So same one cost, draw three cards. If it's trashed from your grip or stack, so that's different, you may draw two cards. Slightly different, I've had worse, not a big deal. Uh, you get this piece of hardware, which might be really good. You suffer a core damage, so combos with the ID. Each event is lowered by one. So it's a two-cost install to save a credit probably on average once a turn. Because it's not once a t it's not limited to once a turn. It's each event. But some turns you're not going to play events that cost anything or any events at all. So it probably averages to about once per turn, uh, which is pretty good, I think. The console is very cool. Uh, you get a plus three maximum hand size. So this is probably going to be mandatory for people playing this core damage uh, style. Uh, you suffer a core damage immediately. You sabotage one whenever the corpse scores an agenda, but it's a cheap console. It only costs two. You get a you get a memory. Probably mandatory just for the hand size. I suspect if people are planning on taking a ton of core damage, uh, they'll probably bring in brain chip from Adam, which also increases hand size. I think that's the one. Let me double check. That's the correct card. Brain chip. I believe. Come on, computer. You can do it. <laughs> Why is this taking so long to load? There we go. Yeah, so it's a late game hand size increase. It is three to bring it in, three influence. I could see people splashing one or two of those, maybe if they're going all in on core damage. Maybe. Uh, I just want to point out this card because it has the most disturbing art I've seen in a while or ever in Netrunner. Look at that cat. First of all, it's holding... Vodka, weird tail, one, two, three, four neck flaps. Does that mean its head like extends? Is that a thing? The implications are weird. The markings on there look like rib cages, like it has rib cage markings. I, I don't know what the implications of that are. It's standing like a person and most disturbingly wearing polka dot underwear. I don't think this card gets played. <laughs> uh, so it's, again, a core damage thing. It gets strength for core damage, but it costs 2 MU, and Anarch already has Paperclip, and Paperclip is so good. <laughs> it's so good. It costs 3. You can play it from, you can play it from the trash, from the, from, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know if this gets played. It's just expensive. Anarch doesn't want to play expensive things because it just wants to go fast and hot all the time, and this kind of slows things down. Maybe you put one of them in for the late game when you have, like, four core damage, and then you can just pay one for every barrier you come across. But, I mean, paying Paperclip, you're paying, like, not that much for pretty big breakers. Anyways, I wanted to point out the art. That's a creepy-ass cat. Um... We had a virus card, another virus resource, uh, literally a resource, but also helps um, a virus strategy because they lost a lot, as I mentioned before. Uh, it, it gives a sabotage one the first time each turn you install a virus. Yeah, maybe. You can only play one of them at a time. I don't know if that sees play. Light the Fire, which was already uh, one of the preview cards, so it has been in standard for a little while. 
uh, is, was seen play with even without the core damage boost from the ID. So this card is definitely going to be mandatory in this Anarch deck. Um, you suffer a core damage, you run a remote server, cards in the root of that server lose all abilities, and then you trash all of them. It's really, really good. <laughs> like, really good. Like, could be banned in the future? I don't know. I think it's really, really strong. Because uh, it will absolutely just destroy some corp decks that really rely on a lot of upgrades and, like, protecting big servers. Like, this is such an anti-Glacier deck. Um, an anti Jinteki and some NBN stuff. And now that you're basically getting free stuff for that core damage, ooh, it's good. Uh, we also get this one. The Twinning. Another unique one. I think that's what it's called. You only play one copy of them at a time. Um, it gets power counters. Oh, this is the turning wheel replacement. I hadn't looked closely at this before. So now turning wheel kind of is in Anarch. So the first time each turn you spend credits from an installed card, which Anarch re got in the previous set. It got a bunch of cards that are resources that you spend credits from. Uh, you place a power counter, counter on this resource, uh, and then you get accesses in central servers. Yeah. Uh, so probably we'll see some play. It's more expensive than the turning wheel. Uh, yeah, probably we'll see some play. Let's move on to criminal. All that to say, I think Anarch's going to be really fun and really strong. Which is better than before, where it was really strong and not fun, in my opinion. Uh, so, a criminal ID, Sable. Introduces the new criminal mechanism, Mark. Basically, if you have a card that uses Mark, at the beginning of your turn, you randomly choose a central server. That server is your Mark. And you get bonus stuff whenever you run on your Mark server. This one's really cool, because it gives you clicks. Uh, which we haven't gotten to Deep Dive yet, but if you've been playing Netrunner the last few months, you know about Deep Dive. That uh, was one of the early spoiled cards from Shaper. It wants extra clicks. So actually, I found that Deep Dive often works best in criminal decks. Uh, it does cost a ton of influence, but it's really good. But anyways, with Sable, if you have Swift as your console, which gives you a click the first time each turn you play a run event, uh, if you play a run event on your mark server, you're gaining two clicks, basically. At the end of that of that uh, click, you're going to have five clicks if you played it as your first. It's, like, it's a lot of clicks. Solid. I think a solid ID. Um, you get cards like this. Identify your mark if you don't have one already. Uh... Gain four. You gain four before you run. Criminal getting money for running is a big thematic thing they have. Uh, this one, you get the money for the run, which is great. Most of the time, you get money after the run is successful or has been attempted or you know or ends. Uh, it's a net gain of three, so I don't know how it stacks up. I don't know how much play it'll get when you have other cards like Bravado that potentially give you a lot more money but it's at the end of the run. I don't know. Here is the Paul Op, the political operative replacement. So Paul Op said you can install it the turn you successfully ran HQ, and then it had a trash effect where you can trash a resed corp card. This one, I think, is a little more interactive and dynamic. So you run any server... If successful, instead of breaching that server, you access one card in the root of another server. So it doesn't have to be a res card. It could be a face down card. If that card is an agenda, you cannot steal or trash it during this access. So it's a card specifically designed to find upgrades or assets and trash them, probably. Um, or you can combine it with... I cannot remember the name of that card. 
the one where you predict what type of card is in the server and then you get money if your prediction's correct. So you could run pinhole threading to ensure that your prediction's correct. I don't think that seems a little inefficient. Um, but maybe you do it on turns where you think it's an asset, but it's actually an agenda. You predict that it's an agenda, you get your money, and then you can run and steal that agenda. So it's a kind of win-win situation. I think this will see some play for sure. Hardware. You suffer a damage when you install it. The first time each turn you make a successful run on HQ, the corp loses a credit. If they do, you gain a credit. This could, especially in Steve Cambridge decks, like it just makes running HQ that much better. So, yeah, credit denial to the corp can be good. But it may just make the corpse really beef up their protection of HQ that much more. I'm 50-50 on this C's play. Also, all my predictions about what's going to be strong, what's going to be weak, what's going to see play, what might see play, probably going to be 100% incorrect. I'm terrible at predicting these kinds of things. Uh, so, I don't know. It's fun to speculate. Here's the console, Virtuoso. It's a mark ability, four costs, so moderately expensive uh, for 1MU. But when you make a successful run on your mark, if it's HQ, you access one additional card. Otherwise, you breach HQ when the run ends. Does this work with Steve Cambridge? I don't think so. Because I think Steve Cambridge requires a successful run on HQ. So it does not combo with Steve which is good because it would make this card insane. Um, it does... No, it does not combo with Panweave. It just gives you the one access. I don't know what other HQ access cards it might combo with, but it's important to un understand that this does not give you a successful run on HQ. So anything that says successful run on HQ... I'm 99.8% sure would not apply. Yeah. So you either get an, a, a breach on HQ or you, if you're already breaching HQ, you get two cards. I don't know, right? Criminal has such a good console in Swift. I don't know if this beats Swift. They also have Penny Shaver, or Penny Saver, I forget what it's called. So this is two cheaper, and the first time you play a run event each turn, you get a click. It's really good. There's also Penny Shaver, which costs three. Whenever you make a successful run, place one on this hardware, and then you can click to place one on the hardware and take all the credits for it. Both of those are really good. I don't know if Virtuoso beats them. It is accesses. Uh, my gut says it doesn't. Let's look at the breakers. Uh, a code gate breaker, a cat's cradle, cheap. The res cost of each piece of code gate ice is increased by one, and then it's standard numbers on the rest. Huh. I don't think criminal usually is better at sentry breakers, right? Weird. Yeah, Shaper's the code gate. That's a decent code gate breaker. I mean, the standard on code gates breakers right now is Unity over in Shaper. This is definitely not as good as Unity by the numbers, but it's in faction for criminal. It has some more credit denial to the corp. Yeah, that could free up some influence you would otherwise put on Unity. Yeah, maybe that maybe that sees play. This one's interesting. Uh, it's two. It costs a memory, which is probably the biggest downside. But it gives you two credits on runs on central servers, which you're going to be doing a lot in criminal, especially if you're doing this mark uh, archetype thing. Uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, if you're going to be running every turn, which you often are in criminal, 
That's pretty good, I think. Especially since it's not unique. You could stack up a couple of these. Probably two, most likely. And then you're getting four cre free credits a turn on runs. On most of your runs. That seems pretty good. We've seen Revolver. This was pretty spoiled. Really nice sentry breaker. It does trash after a little while. But it's cheap and uh, strong. Because you could get pay two to get to four strength, which is a very important number for sentries. Uh, and then it just costs counters to uh, to break the subroutines. They are power counters. It's no revolver as we get to Shaper in a bit, which involves a lot of cards that add power counters. Revolver becomes much better in Shaper now. That's interesting to think about. Backstitching. More free bypasses and criminal it's another thematic thing criminal has a lot we've already seen boomerang which is also cost two uh it doesn't bypass an ice but it breaks two subroutines on a piece of ice this one the restriction is it has to be during a run on your mark which is fine if you're leaning into that uh and you get a free bypass that's really good if you're if you're in that style so that's this is probably a key card same cost as boomerang uh, the only other benefit Boomerang gets is that it shuffles back into your stack, uh, so you can keep playing them. And then we get No Free Lunch, uh, which, if there's a tag-heavy meta, probably is really good. Because then, well, I don't know how good it is. It's good if cards that give you one tag and try to get benefit off of a single tag uh, or two tags, although I don't know how many cards there are going to be that give you two tags. I think there's a new NBN one. Uh, bringing Going down from two to one tag can be very, very significant with boom. Um, going from one to zero is also very significant. Other than that, removing one tag for free is a little bit of savings but not that much. But a 0 to 3 card can be played. I think this will see some play. I think I think it's got enough positives even if you're just doing it for the money that it's probably it's probably going to see some play. All right, let's go to Shaper Padma, Captain Padma. Uh introduces the new shaper mechanism which is charge charge adds a power counter to a card that already has uh that already has one which is interesting so you can't go down to zero on your power counters or else charge doesn't work uh the first time each turn a run on r d begins you get charge one with padma could be cool now here we go deep dive probably the most significant card in the entire set because it's super multi-access I've had a lot of fun with Deep Dive. This is one of the pre-spoiled ones. Cost five influence. People are paying 10 influence to put two of them in criminal decks. I've had a decent amount of success with a deck like that. Uh, it's one of the ones where you have to have a successful run on HQ, R&D, and Archives this turn. And then the benefit is you pay two. Corp sets aside the top eight cards of R&D face up. You access one of them. You can then spend another click to access another one. So, this can win you the game. If you've already stolen one agenda, this can win you the game immediately if you can get an extra click somehow. Which, again, Criminal does really well. So, that's why this card is really good in Criminal. Uh, it's also just a really good card generally. Uh, fantastic card. Strong card. Kind of meta-defining, I think, in some ways. I mean, it's not like required, but it's going to be in a lot of decks. This is a cool card. I really like this card. This is such a Shaper card. It's like Shaper is all about having the right answers, having adaptability. They're slower than Anarch or Criminal for sure, but if you give them a bit of time, they'll be able to set up something insane. And they're kind of a jack-of-all-trades thing, and that's what this card does. Run any server, if successful, for each time you pass to ice this, this run, Resolve one of the following that you have not yet resolved. So if you're going into a server that has three ice, at the end, you can get all three of these. Gain four, so a net gain of three. 
search your stack for a program and install it. I believe you got to pay for that because it doesn't say removing all costs. Still, it's a tutor, very strong. Uh, and then charge one of your cards, which is, you know, helpful. Here's a nice card. This is uh, the Shaper version of Career Fair. Career Fair in Criminal gives you three credits to install a resource. Uh, this lets you install a program or piece of hardware for free, three cheaper. Solid. Really helps when their console costs eight. <laughs> it's an entire ship. But it's really cool. You get two memory, which is great. Shaper often wants to install lots of programs. Um, I wonder if Shaper is going to love this card because they have more memory and they want credits during runs to do, you know, spend money to do stuff with. Three influence, maybe if it was two, would see more. Uh, but endurance, anyways, uh, it gets three power counters on it. The first time each turn you make a successful run, place one ca power counter on it so it self charges. And then if you're playing with Padma and you run R&D, which Shaper often wants to do, Shaper's the R&D running uh, faction, you can charge a card. So potentially you can get two charges on this uh, if you're running R&D. You can spend two hosted power counters to break up to two subroutines on anything. So... It helps Shaper go a bit quicker, except for how much it costs. But then again, you don't need to pay money to use it. I have absolutely no clue if this is going to see play, if this is top tier. I kind of hope it is. It's a little bit like um, Security Nexus, which is Sunny's console. And I love Sunny. So something similar to that really appeals to me. I love big beefy cards that do powerful things. Uh, is it going to be too slow? I don't know. Hyperbaric. When you install this, place a power counter on it. It's a code gate breaker. That's what Shaper's good at usually. It gets strength for each hosted power counter. You can spend two to place them on it. Uh, and then it's a standard interface break. I, with cards like Unity, I don't know if this gets play because you could probably want to charge other cards over this. Cards that get you money or endurance. I have a feeling that one's not going to see much. Propeller, Barrier Breaker, uh, gets four co power counters on it. Uh, gets You would spend the counters for strength and then it breaks barriers. It's very cheap, costing one. Maybe. The problem is Paperclip's just so good. Yeah, this is potentially cheaper. And you're often going to see barrier ice that is two strength or less. You know, cards like Border Patrol, Ice Wall. Um, what's the, the NBN one that traces... It costs two power counters to get past I in, in one credit to get past IP block, which is really good. Yeah, I could see this one working. I could see that one. I, I I'm gonna predict right now that propeller gets more play than hyperbaric. There's my prediction. We get a cat, Daeg, the net cat, and all of his buds. Yeah, they all got names. Uh, whenever an agenda is scored or stolen, you may charge one of your installed cards. Yeah, you want to have this early in the game, but it's unique, so it feels bad to put two, like a full three copies of it in. But if you're going all in on charge cards, you probably want to have it. If you're doing one to two cards that charge with Captain Padma, maybe you can get away with not having it. That's my prediction. Uh, environmental testing... Uh, charges up and then gives you six net credits. Again, if you're going all in on the archetype, I think it probably works. Of the archetypes, 
Man, it sure seems like Anarch got the best one. <laughs> It seems really like Anarch got the best one. I don't know. I'm going to have to play around. I really hope the Shaper charge thing works because I love Shaper. I also like Criminal. I mean, all these seem really fun to play. And then we get this one, which is draw two cards or charge. So it's kind of a damage prevention. It's kind of a replacement for Sports Hopper. Sports Hopper costs more, but let you draw three. If you're at five, you drop to seven, so that prevents the boom kill if you're at full five cards. In that, given that, and then if you're not facing a kill deck, you just charge something. I think this sees play for sure. Let's go over to Corp. We get a new 2 1 agenda. When you score this agenda, you may de res one installed card. There are no runner cards that res. I think. So I think it has to be one of your own cards, uh, which is fine because there's lots of cards that want to be de res or want to be resed again in this set. So it does have some synergistic stuff. It's not just a negative. Uh, but if you don't have the synergistic stuff, you're probably not playing this. Eh, I don't know. A 4 2. 4 2s typically need to have a very powerful ability to justify playing them. There's already a, a neutral 4-2 that gets played that gives the corp money, which is very strong. This one lets them draw cards. I think it maybe gets some play in the Never Advance HB deck. But I think I'd rather, rather have the one that gives me money than cards. Yeah, I think I would. There are, HP does have draw cards already, so maybe. This is a fascinating one. The math of it's really fascinating. Refugee campaigns, another campaign. It costs four to res, costs four to trash, uh, but you get two credits every turn forever. It doesn't run out. I believe this is the only campaign asset that doesn't run out of credits. So if you're the runner, you got to trash this early or it becomes a really bad net credit sink on you. Uh, but if you trash it early or before it's rezzed, you're also losing four credits on them. So ideally you want to trash it the turn it gets rezzed. So they net lose two and you net lose four. That's best case scenario. Given that, it seems pretty good. Yeah. I think I think this will see play for sure. Um, it's also feeds into an HB Glacier strategy, which I don't know if that becomes better with this set, given the rest of the cards. Uh, it at least gives it a little boost, I think. Tree State Model Bioroids. When you res this asset, choose one res piece of Bioroid Ice. Runner card abilities cannot break subroutines on the chosen ice. Interesting. I don't know if this sees play. Note that Bioroid Ice always, I think, always has an ability where you can spend clicks to get through subroutines. So it's not saying that the runner absolutely is going to take all the subroutines, but they will have to spend clicks on it. Uh, which is something you want, paying two for it. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we get two harmonic types of ice, which I believe are the only two harmonic. Let me double check on that. Uh... Yes, these are the only two harmonic ice in the game. I don't know how well they work until we see more. I would like to see one to two more pieces of harmonic ice, maybe in the second set of this cycle. As it is, I don't, I don't know if these work well. Uh, whenever you res a piece of harmonic ice, place one power counter on this ice. It gains end the run for each hosted power counter. So I assume it triggers on itself. So it starts as a 2-0 and the run. So it's just a really bad, inefficient barrier. And then it costs one more to break for each other harmonic ice, so it gets better throughout the game. Still don't know if it's worth it. Because you need, or rather, it's a 2 1. So by the time you res a second piece of harmonic ice, it probably becomes okay. Once you read the th res the third piece of harmonic ice, it starts being fairly efficient. However, 
that means you got to have it early in the game. If you install it mid-game and you're only going to res one other piece of harmonic ice, it becomes really bad very quickly if you don't get it up earlier in, in the game. This one we've seen some play. It's a solid piece of ice. Again, HB isn't really doing Glacier stuff right now. I think it becomes a little better maybe with Glacier stuff. Um, yeah. Oh, one thing to think about with Echo that I was just thinking about. I guess it wants to be derezzed and then resed again because it probably doesn't lose its power counters when it derezzes. Let me see if there's a ruling on that. I don't know how that works. It looks like next silver, but worse. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah, okay. It looks like it combos well with D-Res cards. So it probably does maintain its things, but I think I agree with this person that it's not very good. But you do get D-Res on this and this to maybe build up more power counters wave might be slightly better it's probably not better this seems like bad next we had the next subroutine that 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 rotated out this I, I think we need to see more cards with harmonic before this becomes good uh it does let you tutor for a piece of ice but that's usually not what you care about tutoring for and then it just has one subroutine that gives you money for each piece of harmonic ice so it only gives you stuff it doesn't even hurt the runner in any way uh yeah i don't like that ice but we've hb does get a big deal and this is a big deal uh in that it's gonna be something you have to consider in every hb deck and maybe some other decks it's also huge. It costs 17 credits. Uh, however, it lets you uh, it lets you fast advance a five advanced a five three agenda, uh, which has never been easily possible before, without like four precise cards in your hand or something like that. It's wild. So you can install Agenda, you can advance it, then you can pay 17 for big deal. So you're paying 18 total to get four more advancement counters, and then you can score it. Uh, so it costs 18 to fast advance of 5-3. Pretty crazy. I don't know if it's A tier. I bet it's at least B tier, though. Um, HB can get lots of money. I'm very curious to see. Uh, I do like that it's trashable, so they're only running one copy. Then they've got to play like archive memories to pull it back, and at that point they can fast advance a 4-2, but not a 5-3, or they pull it back one turn and then they play it the next turn, or they can pull it back and play a um, biotic labor and then fast advance the 5-3. So... Yeah, keeping HB low on credits could be pretty important, or at least knowing that 18 credits is the number and doing stuff to make sure they don't have 18 credits. Uh, really interesting card. Speaking of interesting cards, I'm going to skip this one and go to Regenesis and Jinteki. This is crazy. This is super cool. This is either really good or really bad, I think. It's a 3-1 when you score it. If no corp cards have been added to archives this turn... So you can't add the card to archives. You may reveal a face down agenda in archives and add it to your score area. There's already already a Jinteki ID that gives you a credit if you have face down cards in archives. This boosts it. Now, the downside, of course, with making archives significant is that you probably want to ice archives, which means you're not spending ice doing other things for a scoring remote or protecting your more important, typically more important central servers. However, I think the benefit of this card is that it forces runners, if they're hitting Jinteki, to keep archives face up. 
and it puts them into really awkward situations where you can, for instance, put an Ovocado protocol in archives, which costs four net damage to steal, present them with a situation where they've got to steal it, or you get blood in the water out there, um, where it's a two-point agenda, X, the advancement cost, is equal to the number of cards in the runner's grip. Even more incentive for the runner to keep their cards up. Otherwise, you can get some insane two-point fast advances on Genteki. Again, I don't know if this sees play. It might be a little too situational, a little too finicky. They could run, turn face up Opakata, but not uh, score it uh, that turn or hold off on it until they have a better situation, and then you don't get access to Regenesis. So, I don't know. This whole face down archives thing could work. But there's a significant opportunity cost. What else they got in Genteki? A cheaper pad campaign. You get you gain one credit. If you're low on credits, you do a net damage. Meh, it seems all right. Seems all right. It, it is one less to res, but also one less to trash compared to pad campaign. Moonpool's interesting. So you can remove this asset from the game, trash up to two cards from HQ, reveal up to, up to on both of them, two face down cards in archives and shuffle them into R&D. For each agenda revealed this way, you may place one advancement counter on an installed card. I think this actually helps Regenesis. Is that the how you pronounce that? Re yeah, Regenesis. So if you've put face down and done like shell game Jinteki stuff, installing maybe traps, maybe agendas, this can help you never advance an agenda. I should define never advance. That typically means that a situation where you play an agenda, but you do not advance it one turn and the next turn you score it uh, some way. Fast advance meaning that you've played the agenda and score it the same turn. Jinteki likes to do this shell game stuff where maybe they're traps, maybe they're assets, like money assets, or maybe they're agendas. This can help you never advance something. Um, if you have two agendas in archive slash in hand, you could never advance a 5-3 agenda. However, you could also trigger this at the end of the runner's turn before your turn begins, I believe, to trash an agenda, don't reveal it and shuffle it into R&D, keep it in face down in archives, and now you can play Regenesis and find some way to score it or have it already played and then score like a 5-3 and get four points for one score. Really situational, which makes me suspect it's probably not A tier, but also seems really fun, fun Jinteki stuff. So I kind of like it. Here's the one that we've already been playing with that has been spoiled, an enemy. Uh, it's a really good card. It just whittles away cards because uh, you can res it, trash a card from HQ, which again is a theme here, but you do two net damage guaranteed, and then it's a moderately efficient uh, sentry. It's all right. Uh, you often like to find some way to de-res it and then res it again. So maybe it sees some play in HQ or in HB. I don't know. Uh, here's one. If you're doing this archives thing, you definitely want to play. If it's protecting archives, it is a three cost, four strength sentry that does three net damage. That's very, very good. Uh, three net damage is very good, especially if you're trying to protect Obakata protocols. Yeah. Uh, in this archetype, that's a really good card. Evic? Ivic? I don't know. Uh, it, the res cost of this ice is lowered by one for each res piece of code gate ice. Jintaki often likes sentry ice. It does have some very good code gates. But... It's only four to break with paperclip. So, 
I don't know if that's I don't think that's very good. I think the I don't think the numbers work out. Again, very situational also. You don't you want to not res it until you have code gates up and resed. Ugh, doesn't seem good. Mitosis. A double costs two clicks to play. Install up to two cards from HQ, creating a new remote server each time. Place two advancement counters on each of those cards. So you cannot score or res either of those cards this turn. So this is classic Jinteki shell game. Monet, like Efficiency-wise, it's super efficient. You spend two clicks and three credits to do six clicks and four credits of stuff. It can be an agenda, could be a trap. Lots of advanceable traps in Jinteki. I kind of love this card. It's very classic Jinteki shell game. It's kind of an aggressive version of it. I think it could be really fun. And then we get an upgrade, an ambush upgrade, which are always fun. Uh, oh, no, this is the Cyberdex Virus Suite. So slight changes. It costs zero instead of one to trash. Um, if it is resed, which honestly is rarely, oops, it does a net damage. Otherwise, it's identical to Cyberdex Virus Suite. So we put that in Jinteki. I kind of like this idea of putting stuff in faction rather than neutral. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like it. I like the change. NBN. NBN gets probably the strongest straight archetype. I think HB gets the weakest. Whalen gets Whalen stuff. This is like a whole th new thing for NBN, which is advanceable assets and stuff. So we get a new ID. Prov Devost. Prov Devost Consulting. The first time each turn the runner makes a successful run, you may place one advancement counter on an installed card you can advance. This is great. Runners are scared to run against NBN because then you tag them. This makes them more scared to run. So I think this ID even works if it doesn't trigger because it, that means it's making runners scared to run, uh, which means you can do other fun stuff that helps you win. Uh, it's a double bind kind of thing, and I love that in Netrunner. The double binds in Netrunner are fantastic. Core to the experience. And boy, do they get a lot of stuff that you'd want to advance. So obviously agendas you can advance, uh, and we get a 4-2. The runner loses 7 credits when you score it. I think this might get play, uh, especially with the card I do not remember the name of. I think it's in Ashes somewhere. Uh, where is it? Where'd it go? Maybe it's not in Ashes. What's the one that costs... Is it part of Magnum Opus? No. Is it part of System Gateway? Perhaps. Public Trail. That's the one I'm thinking of. If the runner made a successful run... Give the runner one tag unless they pay eight. So credit denial can be very strong. Of course, NBN does lose exchange of information. So this isn't as good as it would have been with exchange of information. Might still see some play. Losing seven credits is a lot. And it helps NBN become the asset ID, I think. Because if the runner's losing credits, that means you can be more free with installing assets because they're less able to trash those assets. Or if they do, they go low on credits, and you tag and kill them. Love those double binds. All right. We get one, two, three advanceable assets. And we get an advanceable ice and an advanceable upgrade that we've already seen. Here we go. Advanceable asset. An ambush, zero cost to res, zero cost to trash. However, when they access this while it is installed, give them a tag plus one tag for each host advancement counter. So all you need is one counter on it, have it installed. They get two tags when they access it, or more if you have more installs on it. Uh, I think maybe you get ones thrown in to a deck here and there. 
I think if you have three, that's probably too many cards because once they see what you're doing, well, the thing is though, you just make it look like a five, three. If you install advance advance, you know, and they think, well, it's 50, 50, if this is a Bologna or a GFI, or if it's check, check us scion. Yeah, that's a tough decision there. So maybe you do see a lot of them. I think this is pretty good. It does require the runner to run. So the thing is, I think all of this, and I'll get to the specific cards, but all of this in NBN I think really pushes that runners have to be super aggressive on hitting central servers against NBN and pseudo ignoring uh, what is in the remote servers which is kind of what you do anyways against NBN. There are certain assets you try to trash. I don't know. It creates a really interesting situation. However, then you get stuff like this. So this is a card like this. You want to run to trash it because if you get two counters on it, you can just give the runner one tag. Again, it doesn't kill them, but maybe I think we get some tag punishment here. We get a gray ops. Remove a tag, and it's a point. Interesting. What are the other gray ops we have? In standard, at least. Uh, X gray ops? I forget the syntax. What, what am I looking for here? Type? Is that what I want? T gray ops? Or maybe it doesn't like the space. Let's try tr T. Uh, I thought that was a subtype. Oh, is this spelled with an A? It's spelled with an A. Um, I don't know which... Let's see, what's... Best defense we've got. You can trash. Now nah, you need lots of tags for that, probably. It's closed accounts is not in standard. What do we have? We have economic warfare, which is one of the few gray ops that doesn't require a tag. Actually, if we do X tag, what happens? Uh, that's probably too much. I'll have to look into uh, what kind of stuff you can do with one tag nowadays. I don't know how significant that is. This might be now the best card. It's kind of a replacement for exchange of information because often exchange for, of information, you try to make it be worth two points. Sometimes it's just worth one point. So maybe it's a little nerfed exchange of information. Excuse me. Uh, but if you're playing a kind of tag-heavy deck and you want to rush out Bolognas and GFIs, and now you can just play this once they're tagged to get your seventh point once you've scored two of those. Might work. Might work. Um, and then we get this guy, Ubiquitous Vig, uh, which runners definitely want to trash. Because if you install advanced advance this on your first turn, if they don't trash it while it's face down, you res this and you gain net one credit and now you're getting two two credits a turn. Cost four to trash. This seems really good. It's also an advertisement, so it combos with Spark. Let's bring Spark back. That would be fun. Uh yeah, that's like a must trash because then you just keep feeding it if you want or this feeds it and then it becomes insane. So the theme here is that you can install advance advance so many things, including this, which we've already been playing with, which is a nice fast advanced card. You have to preload it, but now you got a lot of stuff you can shell game with in NBN. So, yeah, NBN wants to pretend they have five threes. Uh, really good stuff. The ice is pretty good. This is almost like a 
softer toll booth. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. You can advance it, however. You can remove advancement counters to create the toll booth ability. It's a 5 4 code gate. Runner loses three, ends the run. I think it's solid. I don't know if it replaces toll booth. It's three cheaper than toll booth. Seems pretty solid. Um, yeah. And it's something to throw counters on if you don't have anything you're bluffing with at the moment. Because I'm sure the ID can just put this put counters on this when it's face down. You can also more easily splash in some Wayland advanceable ice if you wanted to. I think NBN gets really exciting. And then finally we got Vasilia. Vas Why am I trying to pronounce these? Vasilisa? Vasilisa? I don't know. When the runner encounters it, they may pay a credit. If you do... Oh, you may pay a credit. If you do, place one advancement counter on an installed card you can advance. It's a 2-2 two -two sentry that gives a tag. It also helps this advanceable thing. Solid. Not super exciting, but solid for sure. All right, let's get to Wayland. Finally. Ob. Ob. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce that one. There is a pronunciation guide. I haven't looked at it. But if you go to Nisei.net, uh, they do have a pronunciation guide for all of this. This is crazy. Wayland's crazy. It's gone nuts. Uh, whenever you trash a resed card, except during installation. Except during install. Oh, so which means when you if you can trash ice when you install ice. Um, or an asset if you're overriding an asset or overriding uh, an agenda. Although you wouldn't... Well, you might in Wayland have a resed agenda you override, so... Okay. You may search R&D for one card with a printed res cost exactly one less than the trash card's printed res cost. Uninstall and res the card you found, ignoring credit costs. Use this ability only once per turn. Just on its face, this makes... Uh, border control, which is already included in every Wayland deck, way better. <laughs> so it's an inefficient barrier. Nice when they run face first into it because you get your credit back and then it becomes a little better. But most significantly, you can trash it during a run on the server to end the run immediately. Something they cannot control. Already really good. Because it forces them to waste clicks and money. You push them all the way through the server. They get to the end before they access cards. You trash this. Now they got to get all the way back through the server if they want to access those cards minus border control. Now, if you're playing OB, which is what I'm going to call it, you can use your border control ability and then install a three-cost uh, card to replace it piece of ice and you don't actually you could you can put the card anywhere you don't have to replace it like in the same server it was in install and res the card you found it doesn't specify where yeah this seems wild i i love this actually this seems really really good like really good and it's got a lot of support in here for instance, Azef, which is already seen play because it's a 3-2, uh, trashes a card and it does 2 meat damage, which is, you know, occasionally, very rarely can kill someone. Or it can help with a kill thing you're trying to do. Uh, already seen play, however. Uh, now you get a bonus on it. You get to trash a card and then you replace it with something slightly cheaper. Um... For instance, border control, you could trash it and then replace it with this, which is just border control without its trash ability, but better. Because <laughs> it costs one less, it's two stronger, and gives you one more credit on that subroutine. Yeah, really good. Uh, you also get this asset. When your turn begins, you may trash one of your other installed cards if you do gain three. So you could have like a, a campaign that's a winding down about to be trashed anyways. You trash it and then you install a different asset or something 
or an ice. There's like no specification on what type of card it needs to be replaced with. It can be anything. The res cost just has to be one less. I love it. This is so good. Uh, we get some ice that goes five four three. So you could theoretically, if they're trashable, which this first one is, you could trash. Yeah, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. This one outside of Ob is bad. A five five barrier ice. Wayland just lost one that was advanceable that made it stronger. This is just worse because the fact that it has multiple subroutines, although it loses them each turn, doesn't matter against Paperclip, which is the primary barrier break you're, you're going to see. However, it trashes itself, which is actually really good because then it becomes a barrier and then you can turn it into something that's more punishing. Obviously, barriers being good in the early game before people get their barrier breakers because they end the run and you can score stuff behind them. Outside of Ob, this card is really bad. Inside of it, might be okay. Kind of expensive for an early game face check, but yeah. This barrier is just decently efficient. Probably going to be in decks. Probably. Stavka. Uh, Sentry, Destroyer, when you res this, you may trash one of your other installed cards. If you do, it gets plus five strength, and then it has two trash of program subroutines. So even if they do have a Sentry, the turn you res it, it becomes, for four, a seven strength Sentry with two subroutines you really want to break. Uh, early game of note, it may not be anything if they don't have any programs installed or programs not, not any programs they care about. It becomes a blank card, but I think in this archetype, this is quite good for sure. I think better than development. Yeah, because that could absolutely ruin a runner. Um, also, you could potentially combo it if you splash in some. Uh, where's something, where was it? Oh, you can't. So what you'd want to do is splash that actually in HB, running this card, and then you can de-res it. Potentially, I don't know if the credits work out well enough on that. That might be kind of expensive, because then they know what it is. You keep resing it over and over would be fun. Probably not good. Uh, extract, gain six. You may trash one of your installed cards to gain three, in which case this gives you six credits if you trash a card. Could be very good. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, we get a gray ops. If the runner is tagged, trash installed recourse, resource, install and res one card from archives, ignoring all costs. Yeah, so this could be really good in this deck because you're trashing cards a lot and then you're recurring them to trash them again. And you get the install in res ignoring all costs. So you can keep pulling back your border controls and then keep trashing them to install three cost ice, of which Wayland has some good stuff. Let's see. So we've got, uh, we know this barrier, Mas Maskarovska. Um, let's see. Let's do an advanced search here. Let's find... Uh, da, 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 da. Rotation, fifth rotation, faction, Wayland, um, type ice, cost equals to three. What do they have just in faction? So they have Akit, which is a really good barrier breaker or rather really good barrier already sees play solid piece of ice what do they have outside asfar Af afshar uh this sees play already because it's an hq specialist breaker on code gate oh so you could tutor for this and make sure it goes on hq and then 
it's a three ones with two subroutines, so it doesn't cost that much. But if it's on HQ to get through, they have to lose two credits, so then it becomes actually really efficient. What else they got? Battlement. Oh, I don't know. That's just worse than some other options. We got a lot of barriers here. The one we already saw. An advanceable one. It gets subroutines, probably not important. Sandstone. Sometimes I'll see that if it's a very fast deck because it becomes bad the more they run it. And then Sapper, which is still legal. Maybe Sapper gets thrown in? Interesting. Let's see what they have what we have outside of Wayland. Oh yeah, this all this is legal. I made sure of that. What costs three? What are some things that stand out? Anemone. Although you don't want this resed. You want this to be unresed, and I think you must res. Install and res, that's mandatory. So anemone doesn't work. Uh, da, 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 da. Chrysalis, maybe. Eli's fine. Gold Farmer would be insane, but it's banned. Uh, oh, you could install Gatekeeper. Who? Only two to splash. Oh, this this could really unlock Wayland slow roll uh, glaciery stuff because you could trash your border control to block one run, install Gatekeeper, and now the Gatekeeper for that turn at least is six strength and super efficient. Um, and then you can trash Gatekeeper in a future turn, install something that costs two, um, and you can recur Gatekeeper with trust operation if you tag them. And then you install and res it again. Although, no, that doesn't work because then it's it doesn't get its bonus unless it's res during the runner's turn. What else we got? Macrophage, if viruses are a big thing. Magnet. Could be really, really good here. Yeah, magnet. Wow. There's lots of good three-cost ice and cheap splashable stuff, too. Hmm. Forgot about slot machine. Probably not worth it. But then again, if you're tagging them in way, then you're probably going to try to kill them. So maybe this is better in NBN, where you get more frequently single tags. Interesting. Then we get Mutually Assured Destruction. This card's bananas. And it finally gives Wayland a way to tag runners, which is usually pretty rare. Usually Wayland pulls in NBN cards to tag because Wayland has the tag punishment with Boom and other cards that kill the runner often when they are tagged or have lots of tags. Uh, here's how you give them lots of tags. It's a triple, so it does use up your entire turn unless you play like Biotic Labor. Um, trash any number of your resed cards. Give the runner one tag for each card trashed this way. So if you have Mutually Assured Destruction and something like Biotic Labor... Uh, which I think, which is legal, which gives you, cost four, gives you an extra click on net, or MCA austerity policy, which is something that they got to trash, but once you once you use it up, you get uh, clicks. Um, and then, I, why can't I remember the kill card in, I think, Ashes? No, it's not that one. It must be in, not update, in gateway. Must be in gateway. No, where is that card? It wasn't in Katara, was it? It is high profile target. 
Do two meat damage for each tag the runner has. So usually we'll kill them at three tags. But most critically, only costs one click. Boom costs two clicks. Does seven damage, meat damage. So if you just get one more click, you can mutually assure destruction into high profile target and kill them out of nowhere. They don't even need to have ran the previous turn, which usually is a prerequisite for these types of cards. They could just be sitting along doing nothing except building up their own rig, and you can kill them out of nowhere with the right cards in hand. Yeah. That's really important. I'm very excited about Wayland. Hopefully it's not too strong and has to be just like this, this archetype. It just has to go away be banned hopefully not uh but it makes some really exciting netrunner i think this set just based on looking at it, i think it looks really exciting i think in particular wayland maybe nbn hb seems like the least interesting of everything nbn and jinteki maybe gets fun stuff i think all the runners are potentially really exciting have really exciting strong archetypes that are introduced here so Hats off to the Nisei team. Everything looks great. The art looks great, except for that crazy cat that is going to haunt my dreams. Uh, here, let's look at some blue cards. Like look at Revolver. Revolver looks fantastic. It also is the greatest subtle flavor uh, because you get six power counters on it, which obviously is a six shooter, right? But at the end, you can trash it <laughs> to use <laughs> use it one more time. So you uh, shoot the revolver, run out of bullets, and you chuck the gun at them. Chef's kiss. Love it. Um, yeah, uh, at the very least, again, I I'm terrible at predicting what's going to happen with the meta, but at the very least, there's fun, exciting stuff and really strongly thematic, focused archetypes that might be amazing so i don't know the the thing i know the least about is how these cards are going to mix with all the you know previously legal cards um i'm exciting to see what the expert deck builders come up with in this kind of time of experimentation so netrunner is great if you don't play netrunner i highly highly recommend it or Nisei, which is what it's uh, transitioning into because it is a fan-led uh, program now. It's it's a it's entirely volunteer organization. They're doing incredible stuff to keep this game alive and in some ways, I think, making the game better than ever. And it's already was one of the greatest games ever made. So if you don't play Netrunner, I highly suggest you play Netrunner. The community is super supportive, enthusiastic, and awesome. I'm just sad that I won't be able to play in person for a while because I'm going to be traveling. Uh, but when I get back in September, it's going to be Netrunner time. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please subscribe if you haven't. I was trying to think of what my exit, my closing is going to be. Please subscribe, click like, all that good stuff. Um, everything I do is at thethoughtfulgamer.com. So if you're watching this on YouTube, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. You can Put in your email address there to subscribe to get a notification and an email whenever I post something, which is thrice weekly. Um, and if you'd like to support what I do, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you're as excited about this new release as I am. And maybe I'll play you on Jinteki at some point. I'm playing a decent amount. Bye.